over 90%, I believe, of all physical disease are manifested from stress in the body. So it's like, if we really care about our health, we shouldn't be caring about our physical appearance, but we should actually be paying attention to our stress. And we need more ways to reduce our stress and manage our stress. Because not all stress is bad. Certain stress is actually good. to the show. Today's guest is my homie. Really excited about this episode, Jonah Kest. He is an incredible yoga teacher. He was born into a legacy of yoga. He's from Detroit, Michigan. Um, He's been teaching yoga since 17. Uh, He's traveled all over the world and he is one of the few Nike sponsored athletes for yoga as well. So really excited about this conversation, bro. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me and your beautiful home studio. Um, super excited to be here. I've been a huge fan and uh, I've just admired watching your journey over the last few years. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah, bro. When did we meet each other? We met each other back in 2000, like pretty early. Pretty like, early like on. Yeah. 16, I think it was, maybe. if I remember correctly, we're at Muscle Beach. Yeah, we were. And I think we I were. just came up to you and I was like, yo, what's up, man? I follow you on Instagram. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we ended up, you know, we were both raised vegan, which was, I thought was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, you know, I was just trying to get more muscular at the time. So, no. Nah. And then yeah. uh, we went to the Game Changers premiere, which was pretty cool. True, true. So let's let's jump into that because I, cause I, I wasn't raised vegan. I was raised vegetarian. But you were raised vegan or plant-based or, or what What would you label that as? Yeah, so my I was raised vegetarian as well. Okay. And then I think I was nine years old when my whole family made the switch to veganism. Wow. And um, so that was a interesting transition, you know, really just had to supplement the butter with earth balance and a few other things. It wasn't like that intense, but my mom was incredible cook, so no one was complaining. And then, um, and yeah, it just, it it just stuck. So it was all I knew. Mm -hmm. Vegetarianism, Vegetarianism. veganism, there was nothing. I didn't even taste meat until I was maybe like 18 years old. Oh, wow. Had a few experimental. Yeah. Kind of, (laughs) you know, everyone goes through it. Yeah. Years or, or moments. Yeah, I just had, you know, coaches, like I was a big athlete. I just had coaches, you know, yelling in my face that my entire life, you know, I'll never be strong enough with, mm-hmm. you know, without animal protein. And and I think, you know, just me being a young kid and wanting to experiment and kind of just be, like you said, rebellious against what I was taught. Mm-hmm. Um, I just experimented for myself and I got really sick, of course, and it didn't really work for me. So I just went back to what worked. <laughs> yeah. And it, that was where in the Midwest? Um where I grew up. Yeah. Or Michigan. 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 Yeah. yeah, Not Missouri, Michigan. Yeah. So, you know, it it went all the way back to my grandfather. He was a pretty radical guy. He's actually the one that introduced my father to yoga and he was a really cool, um, he was a doctor. So he was Mm -hmm. very, um, type a very serious guy, always trying to look for the next health trend. And he, you know, he was eating tofu in the 1970s and, and he actually forced all his kids to be vegetarian. And my dad was actually one of the only brothers out of the four that, that carried on vegetarian. So, Mm. I feel, I feel very blessed to have that education and, um, at such a young age, cause I feel like now it's becoming pretty clear that plant-based is one of the healthier <laughs> ways yeah. to go about life. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of coming full circle. I mean, the, the science and the literature is every, everything is kind of coming and being more, uh, investigated to see the legitimacy of this way of life, but it's not a new thing. Like, like eating plant-based is something that's ancient. Um, and it's taught in Vedic traditions. It's uh, other parts of the world. It's something that's very integrated into their culture. But in the Western world, uh, it's something that's very, very new uh, and exciting. But it sounds like you were raised with more uh, Eastern philosophies or maybe around that environment with your dad being uh, a yoga instructor. Yeah, I think it's all connected. You know, it's like people, you wonder why like yogis are vegetarian and you know why people that do CrossFit are probably, you know, not as much vegetarian, at least the mm-hmm. majority. And, you know, it, it doesn't, yoga really doesn't have anything to do with food, but at the same time it does in the sense that, you know, I think you really are what you eat. And um, yoga, um, it's, it's just interesting. Like after you take a yoga class and you feel amazing, you have endorphins flowing and, you, you know, you just finished a nice hot sweat. There's just an intuitive feeling where you don't feel like going through the Burger King drive through You know, you want to get a green juice. Mm-hmm. So I think that's like <laughs> the connection, the parallel that I've always made is like nobody in yoga... 
<clears throat> really tells you to be vegetarian unless, you know, you want to go into like a himsa and all that. I mean, there's mm -hmm. definitely qualities there that support a plant-based lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's just an intuitive thing where it's like, if you're a yoga teacher, you, you, you practice yoga, you just want to eat things that are alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think for, I, I think for, for you and I, that might be more intuitive because that's all we've ever known. Like I was also raised vegetarian. Um, in a spiritual household as well. And we, we practice bhakti yoga, which is more devotional yoga, right? You're very familiar with it. Um, so what, let's, let's get into that because I think that there's kind of a maybe confusion or, or yoga can be interpreted in many different ways. So what is yoga to you and how would you define that? Wow. Great question. So let, let's get right into it. You know, I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out what yoga is. <laughs> um, there's so many, um, definitions out there. There's so many translations to what mm -hmm. yoga is. And um, I would say, you know, the first, before I get into the definition of yoga, I kind of just want to say yoga is so simple. I think mm -hmm. everybody makes it to be this very complicated thing. And I always tell people yoga is not complicated. It's a simple practice for complicated people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the 10 commandments, for example, it's very simple. You just read them. Everybody knows what they are, but living them is so difficult and complicated. And I think that's the same thing with yoga. Living the yoga is the hardest part. But the, to, to make it really easy for and, and you know all the listeners that have never heard of yoga or have never tried it, yoga really is to strengthen the benevolent qualities, which are all the good qualities, you know, peace, positivity, compassion, love, mm -hmm. forgiveness, and to remove the malevolent qualities, which are, you know, anything negative that you want to kind of get rid of, like your, you know, your react reactivity or your stress or your tension, you know, um, your anger, your frustration, all those qualities. So that's really a simple way to put it. Another translation that has really resonated with me in the Yoga Sutras, which is like the, the book of yoga, mm -hmm. um, is Yoga Sutra 1.2. And it says, Yoga Chitza Vritti Narodaha. In, in English, <laughs> that's Sanskrit, mm -hmm. means yoga is to remove the fluctuations of the mind. So mm -hmm. yoga is to eliminate, you know, all the fluctuations in our mind. You know, they taught us math, reading, and history, and science, but they never taught us to pay attention to our thoughts, the place where our mind dwells. And yoga actually tells us to go inward, like we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. and just listen and, and observe all those things that are happening up there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you know, there's other definitions like to yoke and union, mm -hmm. um, you know, the mind and the body. I've heard the term yoga means relationship. Again, mm -hmm. maybe the rela they're talking about the relationship between the mind and the body. Um, I think yoga means to be in relationship, you know, whether it be your significant other or family, um, how to be in relationship and actually come out successful and come out with, uh, you know, balance. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that. Cause I feel like there is that like kind of confusion around it. Like most people, when they hear yoga, at least in my experience has been, um, just hitting a series of poses right? Doing the, the ohms, doing the meditation or, you know, clasping your hands together and doing the namaste, you know, that like is kind of portrayed in, in, in commercials and, and things like that. And I, it's such a deeper practice than that. And the, the, that's the surface level. That's the entry point, right? For many people is to practice the asanas, to practice the poses, uh, to get in touch with the breath. And maybe for many people, this is their first access point ever to where they actually bring awareness to their thoughts or, even bring awareness to their breath and how much it affects your physiology are and you your a, biology. Are you a yoga teacher? No, but I just like it. <laughs> wow, man, I could tell. I like must it. have some yoga books back here. I got a couple. No, I got a couple. Man, you, um, uh, you, no, everything you said was really spot on. And I think that you're right. Yoga isn't just a, a series of poses. You know, it's associated with the poses. Mm -hmm. You know, yoga goes all the way back to India. That's its roots. And, um, is really just an ancient system of Eastern calisthenics. You know, we know what calisthenics are. They're just body weight movements, mm -hmm. but these are ancient, you know, they go all the way back over 5,000 years, as far as we can tell. And really, you know, Ashtanga and, um, all these different systems that come from Hatha yoga, which is the Hatha means the hot sun and the cool moon. It's this union of opposites. That's the mm -hmm. translation. Um, are really just unique ways to touch every single part of your body, you know? So like triangle pose, you know, you're going to target the hamstrings and you're going to open up the hip flexor and the, the shoulder joint. Mm -hmm. I mean, how cool is that they came up with these unique Eastern calisthenics, these body weight movements that can literally take care and nourish and maintenance every single place on your body. I mean, you can almost think of a yoga pose for, for every point. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I think that what goes back into what you were saying though about the mental contributes, you can do yoga when you do anything, you know, and, and that's what you realize. But with new students, it's actually very helpful for them to start with something that's very physical. Mm -hmm. Because if you tell someone that's never done anything like this just to observe their thoughts, you know, it's a little abstract. They're not gonna really get anywhere with that. Mm -hmm. But if you put them in a yoga class and you're in a warrior two and they're feeling everything and they're in their body and they're listening to their breath, now it's a little bit easier to pay attention to what's going on up here. Mm -hmm. Because your breath and the sensations on your body are just a reflection of your mind, of the deepest level of your nervous system, of the deepest level of your mind. And that was one of the insights that I've made um, through my journey, especially after doing and sitting multiple Vipassana meditation retreats is meditation is the highest form of yoga, but it's interesting to see that your breath is actually a reflection, the quality of your breath is to, to how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and if people don't really, if that sounds abstract to people, I like to keep things like really like easy to understand, really beginner entry. Your breath, if you have a hard breath, generally that means you're like kind of angry. What happens when you're angry? What does your breath do? Yeah, it starts to become more shallow. You start to breathe faster. Yeah. A little bit more forceful. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And what happens when you're just really content and you're at peace? Like what, what, what does your breath look like? Yeah, it's much more slow. The cadence on it is like. Ah, that, so what's yeah. easier to observe that or this abstract mind? Like how? Yeah, good luck <laughs> trying to get a, get how can, a grip like, of like what's how, going on in my head. <laughs> you can't really observe <laughs> anger, can you? It's, yeah. it's kind of difficult to observe anger, yeah. but you can observe, um, you know, a short breath, mm -hmm. um, an abrupt breath. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the key insight there where you can actually begin to come out of some of these blind habit patterns of reactivity, where you can see the storm coming before it happens just by listening mm -hmm. to your breath. So if ever I'm in a position where I'm feeling very reactive, you know, the first thing I do is like, Jonah, come back to your breath. And I just start, I just take a few deep breaths mm -hmm. and I'm just like observing, observing, you know, if ever I had a bad habit growing up, like I used to bite my nails really bad. And every time my dad would see me bite my nails, him being the, you know, classic yoga teacher, daddy goes, Jonah, breathe through your nose. I bite my nails, breathe through your nose. And, you know, finally I started to actually feel the sensation before I would, would blindly, you know, I, I didn't know I had my mm -hmm. fingers in my mouth. There are these compulsions, right? Yeah. And um, I think that's, you know, the, the, whole, the whole purpose of yoga is to limit, eliminate your blind habit pattern of reaction. Mm -hmm. That's another big thing. That's, that's great, man. I think this is, there's so many uh, like correlations and understandably so between yoga and, and fitness. Um, you know, both, you know, require the use of the mind, the body, the the breath the more aware of your breath you can be whenever you train the more endurance and resilience you can have whenever you are doing these intense training sessions right and i think whenever i started practicing yoga i'm still i, I still don't consider myself um you know someone that does it you did pretty good on, on zoom the other day <laughs> yeah you know i stretch i stretch daily i try to uh but my practice fluctuates you know some months will go by where i, I lose sight of it and then something uh, like I can feel the tension kind of building up in my body and then uh, something wonderful like the universe will come calling and knocking at my doorstep and you'll like someone like yourself will text me and be like, hey, there's a yoga class starting in five minutes. You want to join? And in that class, I'm able to just notice so much of what's happening internally for me that I've been um, blind to. So just noticing how tight my body's become, how restricted, how rigid it's become from doing the amount of training that I do, because most of my training con consists of, of more uh, constriction rather than expansion, right? It's like when you, when you lift, you're, you're talking about contracting your muscles. So it's very contractive. With yoga, you, although you are utilizing your muscles, it forces you to kind of surrender to this relaxation, which sometimes can be even harder than lifting weights. Because it's it's much harder when your legs are burning and something is stretching and you're like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. The first place you have to go because your mind will start to go crazy is is your breath and like breathe into that area and really bring awareness to the area that are tight that's tight. Yeah, you know, you make a lot of good points. I think you know, just from a physical standpoint, you know, I think not even just lifting weights, but from the time we wake up in the morning till the time we go to bed at night, we're mostly contracting and mm -hmm. we're mostly building tension. So we need at least one thing throughout the day that actually lengthens us, that creates mm -hmm. space, that really opens us up. Um, you know, we don't need to get shorter, wider, and meaner as we get older. We can mm -hmm. actually get longer and stronger, but we need rituals throughout the day that actually encourage that and, and, and support that. And that's a yoga practice. 
You know, I mean, athletes like yourself and, you know, professional athletes, they have the most beat up bodies on planet earth. And, um, unfortunately they're looked at as the epitome of health. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, Oh, like Ronaldo scores a, a goal and he takes his shirt off and rips it off. And everyone thinks he's like the healthiest guy on planet earth. Cause he's jacked and he might be in good physical condition, but I guarantee you that guy has tons of knee problems, you know, from mm-hmm. kicking all those soccer balls and tons of issues. And, um, you know, some of the wisdom that I've cultivated, even at a young age, which I feel grateful for, cause I still beat up my body, you know, I still push myself through things that I probably shouldn't. Um, but hopefully one day my wisdom outgrows my vanity mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I stop giving a shit how I look because yeah. <laughs> I still do, you know, I'm, I, I'm dealing with some, some injuries right now that are almost like my best teachers. Cause they're forcing mm-hmm. me to Jonah, stop giving a crap about, you know, how big your chest and shoulders are and, and start giving more importance to how you're feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but where I was going with that is like, <clears throat> you want to, you know, have exercises, um, that really support longevity. And, um, it's like when you have a car, you know, if you buy a used car, are you going to want to buy that used car from a New York taxi driver? Or are you going to want to buy it from the mm-hmm. little old lady in Pasadena? You know, mm-hmm. cause the little old lady, she drives her car with gentleness. She goes really slow over the bumps and that car is going to look brand new, even if Drew's driving it for 20 years. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> for me, it's like, okay, if I want to be healthy and fit and I want to be able to move, I'm going to pick an exercise that's gentle and that takes care of every single point in my body. Because the harder you are on anything, this is the law of nature, the faster you wear it out. Mm-hmm. And this is, um, this is why I think a yoga practice is, is really maybe one of the most intelligent systems of, of movement because it's, it's very gentle and, and, it, and it tones your muscles, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It's not easy. I mean, I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong. It, it, everyone, there's different levels of it, but even, even for somebody like myself, who is a, like you mentioned, Ronaldo, or like, I'm not comparing myself to him at all. I'm just saying like an <laughs> athlete yeah. that trains frequently for sure. and a uh, professional athlete, you know, Hey, you're probably more it, muscular than Ronaldo. I, I mean, yeah, you actually maybe, are. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, but, <laughs> but regardless, like even with your class the other day that I did, um, I found myself really struggling in some, in some poses and some, some, holds and you i was know, just like the, the, t- the the bigger more muscular you are the tighter tensor you are the quick yeah. the more quickly you fatigue mm-hmm. and um i think that's why guys like yourself and you know obviously you, you don't have a big ego and you're willing to admit that and that's incredible um but you know it's like those are the guys that drop the quickest and i always think mm-hmm. it's so funny when i when i teach in person and i see these big you know macho muscular guys come to yoga and the the incy bincy uh, gymnast, you know, that's 12 years old is, is not taking breaks and he, and you know, they're in child's pose. It's always funny to see that dimension because from the outside, it it looks so much different. Yeah. And this is, this is what I was leaning towards is that there's, it's a different quality of, of, of strength that's required or different quality of, of resilience that's required to do yoga. And, and much of it is, is in the, is mentally right. Is, is how can you sit with this discomfort that you're experiencing and in the gym I can sit with a lot of discomfort like when I'm pushing myself under a bar or whatever I'm whatever I'm training that day I can push myself pretty far um with yoga it's a whole new domain where I'm like how like I really have to bring attention to to what I'm doing and just find new comfortability with with that yeah, it's that whole concept of of finding comfort in the discomfort. And mm-hmm. I think that's what what yoga is. And I think when you're, you know, you're so already spiritually adept and you have a a a yoga practice, I think that you may be doing yoga when you're lifting weights and you might not even know it. Or maybe you do know it because I I can tell with the way you carry yourself and the way you work out, I've seen you, you know, you have this sense of awareness and you have this sense of um I'm going to listen to my body. I'm not, yeah, I'm going to push myself and take myself to my edge, but that doesn't mean I'm going to go over the edge and hurt myself. And, you know, you told me you you've really haven't had any pressing injuries, you know, thank God. No. And I think that's a testament to how, you know, intelligent you train, but also how in tune you are with, with what you're feeling. And that's a quality of yoga that can really be taken anywhere into whatever we do. You know, you can do yoga when you're washing the dishes. That's called dishwashing asana. You You can do yoga when you're walking your dog. You can do yoga in really every moment of your life. But the yoga room, a yoga class is a Mm -hmm. controlled environment where you have a support system. You know, you have, um, it's a controlled room. It's not quite real life, 
but at least it's, you know, it's a step towards real life. So once you come off your mat, you know, I was in that warrior two pose and I was getting shaky and everything inside of me wanted to bail. Everything wanted me to quit, but I was able to breathe through it and let that sensation arise and then pass away. And then I realized, oh, okay, this is not permanent. And then when I face another difficult moment in my life, whether it be a fight with my girlfriend or, you know, something happens, some kind of moment of adversity, whether it be, you know, uh, something on the road in traffic or whatever it may be, you know, I can face that with the same level of wisdom that, you know, this eventually will pass away. I just need to, to come to my breath and, and stay relaxed. So I think that's, that's the whole purpose. You know, if you're just going to get a workout, that's fine. I think that not whatever brings you into yoga will keep you there. Um, but yeah, I think that it, it really does translate into, into everything that you do and it, it permeates your whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, we, we were talking about before the podcast aired about the transferable skills, um, between the different disciplines. So yoga and, and fitness, right. And we, we talked about how, you know, in, in fitness, you can objectively, you know, using your eyesight, look in the mirror. And if you have a coming from a place of fullness, not from a place of lack, be like, okay, I want to develop my body in this way because it's going to make me feel good, or it's going to make me a better athlete. And I love being an athlete or I want to do this particular sport. Um, and you can look at yourself and you can say, okay, I want to develop this area yeah. of my body. Um, what do you, what do you think of that? Is that um, a healthy practice or do you think that can be um, detrimental in your, in your self image and confidence? Like, like for seriously, for, especially for women too, like, I think there's, I think you're also in a whole different class because it's almost essentially your, your work. But I, honestly, like looking in the mirror naked, I mean, it doesn't have to be fully naked, <laughs> but like, what, like, what do you see? And like, did you see, oh, I need to get bigger or are you content with where you're at? So I've, it's a, it was a journey for me because whenever I first started training or I was always a small guy, so I didn't grow until after high school. So all throughout elementary and high school, I was the shortest guy in my class, like consistently. So I think whenever I first started, I was like, I just want to grow. Like, I want to be bigger so people stop, like, pointing out how short I am or making jokes, right? Uh, so I think initially I started training from a place of lack. So from a place of, um, like, not accepting myself fully. And as I grew older, I grew taller and then got more into the gym and started really getting into that. But it wasn't until I was 23 when I really started getting into, into training and it, then it, then it became an outlet. It became a sanctuary. It became like a place for me to really, um, develop myself, but also like, it's like a workshop. Every time I go in there, I learn more about myself and what I'm capable of. Similar to what you just mentioned earlier about how you can sit with a discomfort and watch it and watch it come and go. And then know that you can take that with you anywhere. You can, you can handle quite a bit, um, and build that resilience and that fortitude. So, but then throw in Instagram and then throw in bodybuilding and you're, you're thrown into a world of comparison is, is what it is. Like literally comparison in the sport of bodybuilding, they line you up next to each other and determine which one looks the best. So you can't help but start to compare yourself to other people. It's that whole culture, you know? And, yeah. But the funny and, thing is, is that's not that much different from every everyday life and, and even the average person. Mm -hmm. Because even though they don't have a judge pointing at them, they have all these other things pointing at them, whether it be their girlfriend or their boyfriend or the billboard that says yeah. you should look like this to be this sexy or the products that are trying to sell you things and the TV ads that say you're not good enough until you brought my product. There's all these things that are pointing at us mm -hmm. and wanting us to be different where it's like my uncle always says this and I always thought it was so funny. He goes, if you lived on an Island, you would never yeah. know you're fat, ugly and stupid in the first place. <laughs> if you <laughs> yeah. lived on a deserted Island with no people yes. and um, it's a joke, obviously, you know, but I think it, it has so much validity to the fact that we don't mm -hmm. even, we only think what we are is because of every, what everyone's telling us we are. Mm -hmm. And we would never even have self judgment if there was nothing to compare us to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, sometimes I like to think I'm on a deserted Island. <laughs> yeah. That's a great analogy. It's so funny you say that because me and Bianca had the same conversation the other day about another totally different topic, but it's such a true analogy because it's like, where do you learn these ideas of what is attractive or what is beautiful or what is socially acceptable? These are conditioned uh, beliefs that we learn throughout our lifetime and that many of them are projected 
or being sold to us, right? Like you said earlier, we're being sold the product or sold the problem or. So we're being sold, sold a product and until we buy then, the product, yeah. we're not And then good sold enough. a solution, right? It's like told you that you're not enough and yes. then sold a solution. So well said. Um, coming back to, to the bodybuilding analogy was, you know, I, I went through my kind of like journey through that. So I originally got into the training for, cause I really loved it. And then, or for, because I was insecure, I'll say that. Then I got into really loving it. And then I started competing and it got, like into my head again, you know, like, oh, I'm not as big as the next guy. I got to show up to this show. And part of me, it was like, part of it was healthy. Part of it wasn't. Um, but it wasn't until like a few years into the sport that I kind of realized I was like, this is, this is like unhealthy for me to constantly be measuring up to other people. And it's no longer serving me the way that I wanted it to. Like, I still love training and I can still objectively go to the gym, go to the gym and want to improve myself. But like I mentioned, not from a place of comparison or from a place of lack, but genuinely because I just love moving my body. I love pushing myself and competing with myself and only myself, not with other people. Well, it sounds like, um, you know, your wisdom is, is outweighing your vanity now and you're moving in the, in the right direction, which is really mm -hmm. great to hear. Cause I think you know, a lot of people, well, a lot of people do look up to you in this industry and sport. Um, so the more that you can share, you know, this story and how you use the gym now really is just a tool to, you know, whatever, maybe enter flow state mm -hmm. or, you know, just feel all those endorphins. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger has that famous quote. He feels like there's orgasms all over my body after mm -hmm. a workout. Mm -hmm. I mean, working out feels good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just when we get to that point where we're constantly comparing and competing, it can just get so draining. And it mm -hmm. eventually doesn't serve us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks for uh, being vulnerable and, and sharing that. Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, my, my, the, way, the way I use my platform has changed over time too. Um, and fitness for me has always been an entry point for something deeper, for a connection with self. And I think that many people may approach fitness in order to fit themselves into that box that they've been sold, like we mentioned earlier. And you can still benefit from it, but develop the relationship to it in a different way to develop the relationship with yourself and still have all of the benefits of it, but no longer have the attachment to the comparison. Mic so, drop, mic drop, boom. So this is, this is how I try to use my platform now is like, yeah, I'll post a picture, you know, showing my physique or whatever, but really trying to use it as a Trojan horse to get people to, to really take care of themselves and, and prioritize their health and their fitness, their take care of their physical vessel. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, it's, we get our oils changed more than we'll, you know, service ourselves. Isn't that a, yeah. Like, like, like yeah. Like people will literally get their oil changed every 3000 miles, but before they for, get their colon checked or something yeah. with anything before okay. they refuse to go to the doctor, they refuse to get a massage every now and then, you know, they refuse to really service themselves. And it's so important. That's why yoga is like a full body maintenance system. You know, exactly. that's really what it is. It's, I mean, it's not really a workout. I mean, it can be a workout. You can mm -hmm. make anything a workout. It's reparative. It's restorative. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it, and it deepens the connection that you have with, with yourself, you know? So you really get like, I, like I, I called it a workshop with, you know, the gym, but you can have that workshop, you know, with yoga at any time of the day is just really deepening that connection to yourself, which beyond the noise, beyond the conditioned beliefs, beyond what, you know, these, um, qualities that we're trying to ascend from. Right. Yeah. And, and this, this, I, I think is a really good segue into this next like topic of you know, if you want to try yoga or if, if you're interested in trying yoga, it doesn't have to replace everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, I'm not, I'm a yogi, but I don't only do yoga. You know, mm -hmm. I would consider myself to be an athlete. I surf, yeah. you know, I play basketball. Um, I ski. I, I do a lot of things that are physical, but I'll tell you that the yoga only supplements all those things. And it seems like it's done that for you. It's a great counter, um, it's a great counter practice to, mm -hmm. to really keep you in check and to, to keep you healthy and strong. And that's why more and more athletes are starting to do yoga. And that's why Nike was interested in, mm -hmm. in, um, in bringing yoga because, and even the way Nike's approaching it is, is a lot of big, you know, companies are that in sports is they didn't want to come in like, okay, we're going to be all granola and we're going to ohm and which are all great things, but they're coming in like yoga can actually accentuate and, and increase your recovery and all these physical benefits for every sport. It doesn't need to be this intimidating thing where you have to wear all white, you know? Yeah. 
So I, I think that's, uh, and you're, you're a great testament to that. Cause you know, I think that's why we need more people that can actually be an example of, oh, you do yoga too. It's not just for girls, you know, like this mm-hmm. strong guy does yoga. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What do you, what, what's your experience been with, uh, being like a guy yoga teacher in a, I, I don't know if it, if the perception is that it's more, uh, female oriented or that more females are into yoga mm-hmm. compared to, compared to men. Yeah. I, I mean, even growing up, you know, I, my father, just a quick little blurb on, on my, on my story. Uh, my father was a yoga teacher. He was introduced to yoga at the age of 12 and he, his dad took him to India. His dad found yoga because he had bad back pain and ended up going on this healing journey. But long story short, he, uh, he forced them, them to yoga and took them to India and they lived there for a pretty long time. And, um, and then, uh, you know, your dad wants to teach you what, what he learned. So I was brought into yoga. I had no choice. I was forced to do yoga pretty much my whole life. And did you resist it? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, you know, of course. I remember the, <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't, um, I was a little bit of, a, I'm an Aries, so I can be a little crazy and reactive. And I think that's why yoga probably found me and my family in the first place. The, the Kess family seems to be a bit <laughs> wild. Um, but you know, every time I would get suspended from school, my dad would make me go to the 6am class for the whole week. I got suspended. I'll never forget that, that week in middle school. And, um, sounds like your detention. <laughs> yeah. like and I was like an athlete. Exactly. I yeah. was an athlete. I was a macho guy. And I, I always tried to, and the last thing that a macho guy wants to do is stretch, right? Cause stretching is the opposite of getting bigger or, mm-hmm. you know, using your muscles. Exerting. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I think that there's this disconnect and there's not a lot of men that do yoga because it's literally the opposite of what, you know, the culture wants for men. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the disconnect. And once that kind of gets shattered, I think more and more men are doing yoga. And to be honest, I mean, maybe only in LA, sometimes I go to yoga classes and there's more men than women. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's because they're ch- all, they're all catching up to what mm-hmm. <laughs> there's so many women in yoga classes. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I taught a yoga class in LA the other day and there was more men than women. And I was so shocked. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm probably going on a tangent there, but I well, remind me where I was at. Yeah, no, I just, your experience with being a guy yoga teacher. I mean, I, in my experience, it's, it's kind of been the same, you know, the, just the general like conversation around it is that it's more feminine. And like, even like when I post stuff, like I get like tons of interesting comments from people online that may not know about yoga. Like I got a comment recently that said like stretching is cool, but yoga satanic or, uh, <laughs> stretching is, or, or yoga is for women or, or mm-hmm. like, you know, just the comment. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been getting that shit my whole life. You know, yeah. it's like, I've been, been made fun of being a vegan. I've been made fun of yeah. for having the, the dad that comes into the, the, you know, fourth grade class and teaches the whole class yoga that, you know, I've been called it. I've been called it all, you know? And yeah. I think, it's also what has you know made me different, and um, I've actually learned to appreciate being unique and different. Mm-hmm. And um, it took a while. I spent a lot of my life trying to fit in. You know, I, I still look back. I went to one year of college, and I just remember like you know knocking on doors and trying to. Um, what's that one week they call before for oh, rush? For rush, I was yeah. rushing, and I I got into this fraternity, and it was such a a toxic culture. Yeah. And um, essentially, I hit a breaking point, and. Um, I had to drop out of school. I got really sick, probably from doing too many drugs um, and drinking too much, which was just poison for me. I was just, I never did it. So my body was like literally just rejecting it. And, um, but yeah, I I learned to appreciate being different. And I think that's finally what allowed me to just step into who I was. And it was this incredible experience because as soon as I accepted it and, and actually embraced it, I started to attract Mm-hmm. everything that I've ever wanted. And I started mm-hmm. to attract like-minded people like yourself and people that were also on that journey of following their passions. And of course there was like a moment of, you know, maybe a period of time of loneliness or a period of time where I didn't have that many friends. And, but I think everybody has to go through that, you know? And mm-hmm. um, now it's like, it's been the biggest blessing. And my, my father's always told me do yoga and everything else will be taken care of. And so far that's been true. If you want to check in with me a few years from now, I'll let you know, but <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's worked out. So, um, I just feel grateful to be in a position where I can give people a tool to come out of their suffering and to really help them with everyday things. And, and that's, that's the work that I do. So mm-hmm. I, I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah. It seems like you're, 
uh, living your divine purpose, right? Is the Dharma that people Dharma. talk about, uh, which is, <laughs> which, Dharma, is that's yeah, it. which is, which is interesting because I feel like you and I have such a similar story, you know, being raised in a more alternative or untraditional, um, lifestyle or household, and then trying to fit in so desperately with your peers, not recognizing the the gift that it is to have that perspective, to have a different perspective than what is considered normal, because not only does it teach you to appreciate, um, diversity, but it also teaches you that you can coexist with people that have different opinions, different lifestyles, um, different spiritual practices, and still connect on such a level that is, is human in so many ways. And when we try to pretend to be somebody that we're not, we only move further and further away from, from what is meant for us. And sometimes it does take that journey of, of venturing out and trying to be somebody that you're not and not listening to your intuition and following the path that you believe is you're supposed to. It's all part right? of it, right? And then coming back with that perspective and being like, I'm so grateful for all of those experiences because now I know what I don't want to do Exactly. Which is sometimes just as important as knowing what you do want to do. Right. right? And that's why, you know, I, I always say that the path is the practice because, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not it, everything is the practice. Your whole life is the practice. And, you know, every moment is an opportunity to essentially move closer and closer to, to the truth of, of what you are and, and, and find your find your beauty and, and find your dharma, your purpose. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody does have a purpose and I, I don't think it needs to be as specific as, as your career. I think a purpose can be, can be bigger, but I mean, maybe just from your experience, how do you think someone that is feeling lost right now and, and, and maybe in their life or they're young and how can they find their purpose? It's a great question. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one. I think purpose is, is, is kind of a, a, um, a term that's thrown around it's a loaded word. Like people are like, Oh, I don't, I don't have a purpose. Like where do I fit in, in this grand scheme of things? And sometimes people's purpose can just be to merely express their creativity and create whatever it is that they were, they like doing, Mm. you know, it doesn't have to be, you you don't have to be the next game changer. You don't have to be (laughs) the next person that's influencing the world. Well, you were the next game changer. Yeah. (laughs) I use that as an example because like many people think that they have to be on that level. Like sometimes like, some of the most important people are the people that are are in the shadows that are doing this really great work and that go unnoticed, right? So it doesn't, like purpose can mean many different things, but I think if, if you really take a moment to discover what it is that you enjoy and what brings you fulfillment and happiness, that's a good starting point. And you can expand on that. And sometimes that takes experience. Sometimes that means trying something. Maybe you don't like it, maybe you do. Uh, but maybe that can lead you to the next step in your path, wherever that is. I think, I think you really just hit a nail on the head and, and to kind of like refine what you said, you know, you said maybe your purpose isn't really a purpose, but it's just to share your creativity. I think that's what you said. Mm -hmm. And that, that I think really resonates. I have a really good friend named Sunil Gupta, who is an author. And, and I remember him telling me over dinner that he asked every morning when his daughter wakes up, he asks her two questions. He said, what's the meaning of life? And she goes, um, and then she answers to find my gifts. And then, mm-hmm. and then he asked her the second question. He goes, and what's the purpose of life? And she goes to share my gifts and give them mm-hmm. away. And that, I just got the chill saying it because really that is what purpose is. And I even had the opportunity to ask Sadhguru because I, I was still trying to figure out my purpose. I mean, it was almost handed to me on a silver platter. I mean, don't get me wrong. I had to go through a lot of challenges to, to get where I'm at. Um, but then again, I was brought up in this. It was, it was right there. But I asked Sadhguru, I'm like, man, how can kids, you know, find their purpose or even adults? And he goes, he goes, you don't even need a purpose. And this is Sadhguru. Like this guy, this guy knows, you know, he, he knows some things. <laughs> and he goes, people in history who've had really strong purposes have often been people in power who have done really bad things. Like look at Hitler. He had an incredibly strong purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes the purpose of life is just to live. You know, um, Alan Watts says, uh, Re- life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. Mm. So I think we have to, like, sometimes you have to take a step back and, um, and just live, just live yeah. your life. You know, you, not everything has to have this tremendous amount of purpose, but that being said, it is nice to have this, this, um, this outlet, this platform, this tool of expression, like yoga for me has been so much more than teaching people triangle posts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's brought me all over the world. It's, um, it's, it's, given me an opportunity to connect with so many incredible people. And, um, 
it's so much more than, like I said, like like a physical asana. Mm-hmm. What's what's one of the biggest lessons that you've learned from traveling, from connecting, from people all over the world, different cultures? I saw you were just in Egypt. Um, you're constantly like just on the go, bro. Like I see you in Tulum and Costa Rica and like been crazy. Yeah, especially as the world's opening back up. Yeah. What would you say is is one of the biggest lessons that you've learned? You know, I, I think there's so many lessons to, to traveling and without giving you like the cliche answer of, you know, travel gives you perspective, which yeah. it obvious, I think there's cliche for a reason. Um, I would say that we're really all the same and we're not as different as we think. You know, we're really, you know, not separate. I think this is like one of the teachings of of yoga and it's become more and more clear as I've traveled the world and, and have taught, so you know, thousands of different archetypes and body types and um, have met so many people, even with different languages and, and have, have been brought up with different religions and cultures. I just realized that we're really all the same. You know, we're all just looking for, for love. We're all just, you know, really wanting to be, to be seen and to be felt mm-hmm. and to be touched. And I think we all have um, very similar basic needs and that we're all truly um, reflections of each other. You know, last night I was talking to this with Andre. Um, it came up at dinner, you know, <laughs> We were saying it's almost impossible to see something in somebody else that you don't have within yourself. Mm-hmm. And there's, um, there was an incredible story. It's a little silly story. I know you wanted to, to be silly on the show. So um, it, it's a story of the Buddha. He was meditating um, as he is. <laughs> underneath as he does. The, as he does. <laughs> underneath the Bodhi tree. And um, I guess the, this particular Bodhi tree was nearby a school. And this kid comes up to... This, this big bully comes up to the Buddha and he, he disrupts the Buddha while he's meditating. He goes, he calls him a fat pig. He goes, you fat pig. He goes, what are you doing? Get out of here. You know, st- he, just, he was just bullying the Buddha. And the Buddha, of course, is this very wise, you know, relaxed, equanimous, non-reactive being. He just comes to his breath and he, he looks at this troubled young man and says, you the Buddha, you the Buddha. And the kid goes, What? what? I'm the Buddha. I just called you this fat, ugly pig. Why are you calling me the Buddha? And the Buddha says, because you only can see in others what you are yourself. And you know, this kid must have saw a fat, ugly animal in in himself, Mm -hmm. but the Buddha only saw the the quality of Buddha in other people. And the Buddha actually isn't the name of the person. The the Buddha we're talking about, his name is Gautama. Mm -hmm. Buddha actually isn't the name of a person. It's the name of a quality that's inside each and every one of us. And the Buddha saw that quality in every single person he came in contact with. So I always make the joke. I say, if you want to find some, uh, if you want to do something good for your ego, just find the best in everybody. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's gratifying to your ego. Because if I can see something good in you, I must have it myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you know, go out in, in, in your day and, and, and go, go find, give some compliments, but genuine compliments. Because, you know. But hopefully uh, that answers yeah, that question. No, no I, th- I think so. Like it kind of like touches back on what we were speaking about earlier is like, you know, we can all coexist even with our different cultures, our backgrounds, our perspectives. Like fundamentally we are all one and the same. We're the same. We're not yeah. separate. You know? Yeah. And you know, it may seem like we're islands apart. It may seem like we're so different, especially with technology and, and all these, you know, things. But, but ultimately, you know, you just have to look into somebody's eyes for a period of time to realize that we're, we're all the same. Mm-hmm. We're really all connected mm-hmm. on a deep, deep level. Mm-hmm. So how can somebody that's listening right now l- develop the practice or have a starting point to developing that connection with themselves so that they can see it in other people? Yeah. If, if you're listening to this, to this podcast, I would say the, the first step is to just spend time with yourself. You know, we're, we're, we're living in a world of entertainment. We're living in a world of distraction. Yes. I mean, from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, we're, you know, we're drinking our coffee and then we're, we're on our phones. We're constantly being distracted. So maybe throughout your day, just find five minutes where you just close your eyes, turn your attention inwards and listen to the touch of your breath and just observe that and, um, and see what that does for you and, and see how that influences some of your relationships. See how that changes, you know, when you wake up in the morning or when you go to bed at night, if you meditate, just see if you fall asleep a little bit differently or see Mm -hmm. if uh, your significant other is, uh, you know, feels that in you, that shift and and maybe is softening around that. And and maybe your girlfriend or boyfriend isn't as tight or tense when you're around or you're fighting less. 
just do a little self experiment and just close your eyes. It's really not complicated. Remember, it's a simple mm-hmm. practice for mm-hmm. complicated people. Close your eyes and, and listen to the natural, normal flow of your bodily respiration. And I promise you, that's like almost the best out of all the things that I've learned. That's the best tool I could give away. And mm-hmm. it's the most simple. But then again, like the most simple things are the hardest things to do. Yeah. It's hard to practice. It it's really hard to is. Practice, especially when you're flooded with emotion. Like you, like you said, it's really hard to be aware of those feelings whenever they're coming up because we, we've... Because they're already they, there. They're there. Yeah. You're they already come swept out. away. Yeah. Oftentimes they want to come out. So to, to, to shift the, the nature in which they come out, the expression is some of the hardest things to do. Like I'm just speaking just for myself, you know, I'm not speaking for anybody else, but just for myself, whenever I get angry or frustrated, I can feel it all in crawling in my skin and it, it wants to come out in the form of anger and frustration or movement or like force you know what I mean so to have that that pause of noticing what's happening and noticing the breath or noticing the sensations that I'm experiencing you just you said it the crawling in your skin what do you think yeah. that is that's a, a bodily sensation that's arising there's always a chemical imbalance that happens deep within the framework of your body when an emotion arises mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. for every thought that we have even deeper than the emotion to every thought there's some kind of biochemical response that happens within our body that results and manifests in either into a bodily sensation or an abnormality in your breathing mm-hmm. and that's what the yogis figured out because they're scientists you know, yoga is a science experimentation with observation. That's what science is. And that's what they figured out. And now you can catch that sleeping volcano before it erupts, before you get swept Mm -hmm. away by, and and then, you know, do something that, you know, where you hurt yourself or you hurt someone else before Mm -hmm. it's too late. You can actually go inwards and, and, and basically stop the storm before you get swept away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I've noticed too, is like, all of those opportunities, like those moments are all, oppor- they contain the seeds of opportunity within them. They, they're showing you something about yourself. They're showing you some, some discord. What's, what's that Peter, Peter Crone quote, um, quote? Oh, he says, um, life shows you the people and circumstances to reveal to you where you're not free. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I'm a hey, big Peter Crone fan. Peter, I'm going to have you on the show. Peter, you're ASAP. next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully if he, if he wants to. Yeah. Uh, but I'm yeah, sure he'd be down. life is definitely showing you the people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. Right. And if so, we can have tools to, you know, to help with those moments where we're not free, I mm-hmm. mean, it's only going to benefit. So I love that quote. That's a great quote. Mm-hmm. You had, you had a great one in your class too, that, um, I'm going to let you share it, but it was the the Stanford professor uh, where he gave his students the piece of paper. Hey, you were I listening. really like that. I was listening, bro. I was, hey, I was struggling, but hey, I was listening. Hey, I had you spotlighted too because <laughs> I, I was like, I need everybody to see this guy, you know? Me and my Delgado's in my Zoom yoga class. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, that was a fun story. Maybe I'll share that, the, yeah, the, yeah. the piece of paper one. Yeah, I like that story. Yeah, there was this famous Stanford professor, and I read this in an article. A yoga student shared it with me years ago, and and he, he handed out this pop quiz and he just handed a eight by 12 sheet of paper. Um, and he told the whole auditorium to flip it over. And on that piece of paper was a small black dot. And of course he asked everybody just to, to journal a little journal prompt, write what you see or, and of course, all these students being very type a and, you know, you know, strong students, they all wanted to kind of figure out you know, the shape, the size, you know, why it was placed in the center versus the, you know, they tried to literally explain this black dot, this abstract thing that had no meaning and they became obsessed with it. You know, people spent hours trying to figure out this hidden meaning of what this black dot was. And, you know, the, when the quiz was over, the, the professor says, you know, you guys all failed. <laughs> nobody <laughs> passed because nobody wrote about all the space around the black dot, the white space, you know, the, the possibilities. And, and, and ultimately, I think what came through in the yoga classes, that becomes a great metaphor in our lives. Because when one bad thing happens to us, when those black dots come up in our life, we become obsessed with them. And we miss all that space. We miss all the, the blessings. We miss all the possibilities, the opportunities, all that white healing space around what we're dealing with, that whatever that black dot may be, whether it's a, a flat tire or a bad shot in golf mm-hmm. or a fight with your girlfriend, yeah. you know, a mean when, comment or some, whatever, something, a, yeah. a mean comment on yeah. your yoga Instagram reel, whatever <laughs> yeah. it is, we can become obsessed with that black dot and, and it literally makes us blind. We miss all our blessings and miracles. 
And um, that's what yoga does is it gives us this perspective, literally, like when you put your foot behind your head or you go into an inversion, you're literally seeing things from a different angle. Like literally, <laughs> and that's what people don't get is like, yeah, you're, how do you get a new perspective when you do yoga? I mean, just put your foot behind your head. You're, you know, you're going to see things differently. Than you ever seen the world with your foot behind your head? <laughs> so It's a whole other world out there. Yeah. And I, I think that's like what goes back to, you know, like the practice of yoga is it's, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to, you know, heal your relationships or solve any of life's deepest problems by having loose hamstrings. You know, mm. that's not the end all cure all. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of people with loose hamstrings that have a lot of shit going on in their <laughs> life. <laughs> so if you're listening, you know, it's, it's, flexibility is not going to cure all your, you know, your ailments. Um, you know, you may walk around with a little bit less tension than everybody else, but um, ultimately what we're trying to do is, is like you said, release the tension in our bodies. You know, tension's just trapped energy. And um, trapped energy can can be stress. And the American Medical Association is telling us now, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but over 90%, I believe, of all physical disease are manifested from stress in the body. So it's like, if we really care about our health, we shouldn't be caring about our physical appearance, but we should actually be paying attention to our stress. And we need more ways to reduce our stress and manage our stress. Because not all stress is bad. Certain stress is actually good. And you know that because when you lift a weight, you stress your muscle and then it gets bigger. So there's actually a really good book called Stress is Your Friend. I can't remember the name of the author, but if you want to dive more into that. Um, but ultimately, stress can be negative. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, yeah, if we really care about wellness, if you really care about health, you're going to figure out more and more ways to get rid of that stress, like cold plunging or, you know, hot saunas or, you know, meditation or reading a book. Um, so yeah, that, that. yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. I'm, I'm on, you're I'm on, on board. board with you. Everything that you're saying, I'm, I'm 100 on board with. I think that like, oftentimes, what people feel as normal, um, isn't necessarily natural, right? Is, is somebody's normal can be hypertensive. It can be chronically stressed. It can be anxious. It could be all of these things that are this person's normal, but it's not the natural well-being that you you have access to. And I think that the more we can get in tune with that and be aware of these sensations or this like this body that we live in, essentially, like we're confined by this by this body and, and the way we interpret the world around us. And it's always sending us signals, but sometimes it, it becomes so hard to, to listen to the signals because it's become noise. And we have this constant noise that's with that's happening within us. So it's like yoga, weightlifting, meditation, breathing, cold plunges, whatever else. There's a common thread there, isn't there? It's like, they all, they're all very different, but they all like, they all share something very similar. And I mm -hmm. think that every single one of those activities slows time down Mm -hmm. And it makes you pause and reflect and um, ultimately observe yourself mm -hmm. from a different perspective. Like, you know, the cold plunging, I've been digging so much because it's like immediately, as soon as you get into the cold, it's like time stops. Like, mm -hmm. You think life's moving fast? Go into a fucking cold plunge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> <was> true. <laughs> that one Facts. minute will last like 10. Facts. And um, another opportunity to practice being comfortable in discomfort, which is, I think, also the common thread in all these things that you just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was ironically I was watching uh, Titanic the other day and couldn't help but think I was like, man, I know that feeling. Like maybe not as to the degree of being in cold water that long, but yeah, but yeah, uh, just being in a cold plunge. Uh, just the few times that I've done it, I'm not. I don't practice every day, or I don't. Yeah, I don't we did have it the that. other day at Andres. Yeah, yeah. And I was almost embarrassed of how short I lasted in that because I did one in Mexico a few you did good. months You were back. there for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, but the first, the, the time I did it in Mexico, and this also just is a testament to your um, state of mind before entering something like that and how much of a difference it makes in your resilience towards it is when I did it in Mexico, I, I had this breathing practice. I prepared for it. Um, I also had like a, a guide there that was helping me through it, uh, telling me, you know, what I needed to hear to push past that threshold of, of the intensity of those first couple seconds or first couple minutes in the cold plunge. And I lasted like 14 minutes. That was the first time I had done it. Um, yeah, in, that, in that years. doesn't say that doesn't speak loud. I mean, that's an incredible example. Cause I think, um, I mean, yeah, look at the difference, right? I mean, mm -hmm. preparation meets opportunity and, um, especially 
deep breathing and certain pranayama exercises before entering something like that, or even just getting yourself like hyped up mentally, just like, mm-hmm. you know, you're going into it. That's why Wim Hof, whenever he does those retreats, they're all like chanting and banging their chest and like mm-hmm. just getting into this like primal state. Yeah. Um, Cause when they, when they enter the cold, it's like way less effective. And even Tony Robbins has done this for years where, you know, they walk the coals. Have you, have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And, and they all get like, they do all these pre rituals and, yeah, rituals. and you don't even feel the, the cold, hot coals underneath your feet. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you're in this such like receptive, like, um, you know, s- high state. Yeah. I, I was doing a little bit of like reading on the difference between habits and rituals and habits are something that we do unconsciously oftentimes and rituals are something that we do with intention, right? It, it's a specific intention of the task of what, which we're doing. And you can apply rituals towards anything to, uh, to develop better habits, right? So for somebody that finds it difficult to wake up every morning and and do a yoga practice or to um, meditate or to even go to the gym or to even eat eat healthy, any of those things can have rituals um, that are the precursor to the habit that you're trying to build. So for me, for example, I also find it difficult to wake up every morning, even though I try my best to wake up and, and meditate and spend at least 20 minutes practicing mindfulness. Um, it helps when I do the ritual of like lighting an incense of putting on, um, the lighting in my, in my environment to sitting in a specific location. Like everything is very intentional to help make the habit that I'm trying to cultivate easier. So for things like training, I do the same thing. I, I, on the way to the gym, I'll have like a, a playlist that I play. Some of it's like motivational speeches. Some of it is, is music that gets me amped up you know, it gets me into that state of mind and I take a pre-workout, you know, to get my, my, my body primed for the type of training that I'm about to, uh, to do. So what, what would be like a, a good ritual for somebody that's trying to implement or develop their yoga practice? Man, I was just, I was like making mental notes on all the things you were saying. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you hit them all. I mean, some of those like things like lighting incense or just creating those subliminal, you know, messages and, and really creating a sacred space. Mm. Because if you have the sacred space, you know, then it makes it way easier to to perform or to, you know, like even, in a, you know, when you're making love to your your significant other, you know, if you have a sacred space and there's candles lit and there's, you know, I don't, we don't need to get too into it, but, you know, it's like, it makes the whole experience that much more beautiful and present. And um, I think this, the sacred space and the style of vinyasa yoga that I teach and what I've learned from my father, um, he calls it the seven doorway method. And um, this is something that he's kind of intuitively um, evolved over the 35 years he's been teaching. And the first doorway is sacred space. Mm. And this doorway is all about, you know, um, really just allowing people to come as they are. And I think that's missed. And it's like really the most important doorway. Because if you miss this one, the rest of the class kind of loses, or at least all the other doorways lose that connection and intimacy. Um, You know, it's so often you go to a class and immediately the teacher starts talking or the music's on or they... They tell you to do something, which is really a judgment. So the whole concept here in sacred space, when, when we teach in this style, is to actually say nothing and just let the students have that one minute or two minutes, because everyone came from a different place, whether you just mm-hmm. caught the bus to make the class or you had this crazy stressful day at work or you just got done smoking a cigarette, whatever it may be, everyone's in a different place. So the last thing you want someone to do is to start telling you what to do. It's like, just give me a few minutes to be mm-hmm. as I am, not as I want to be not even he, how you think I'm supposed to be, but just as I am. And I've noticed if I take that same concept into all my relationships, like if I come home and um, you know my girlfriend's in the kitchen and if I just take one to two minutes just to observe and listen and, and just be without like, you know, telling her something or telling, the rest of the day is like bliss. Like there's no mm-hmm. fights. You know, if I take that intentional two minutes just to like really be present and listen, and that's all that yoga is. It's just listening. That's if, if you want to dumb it down even more, you're just listening. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of answers your question. And I think you hit it with the rituals, but we need more rituals. Um, so any, you know, any rituals that you, you can think of, mm-hmm. I think you should it works share. for you. Yeah. Like, I mean, everybody's different. Everybody's different. Whatever is going to motivate me might not be motivating for somebody else or inspiring for somebody else. Yeah. So I, I think, I think it comes down to finding what, gets you into that state of mind, you know, or what primes you for, for the task that you're about to undertake. Yeah. I mean, I, I I like to think of rituals too, as like, um, I like to call them prana rituals. 
And a, a ritual for me is something that um, supports my prana, which is in prana is a Sanskrit word that means life force, um, your energetic life force. So anything that I do that supports that is a, is a prana ritual. So a prana ritual could be brushing your teeth. Um, which I hope everyone does. <laughs> a prana ritual could be um, breath work. You know, prana is your breath coming in and out. Mm-hmm. So breath, that's only going to expand you. It's not going to shrink you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, but I, I like how you think of it because that's going to kind of challenge me to like, how can I actually create an environment where it supports those prana rituals? Because sometimes it's like the hardest thing to do is actually just show up and start, mm-hmm. right? So- mm-hmm. Yeah, I always tell people it's not, the hardest part for most people isn't working out. It's getting to the gym. <laughs> oh my, that's or so it, true. It's getting to whatever class or whatever training they're about to do. And that's where the, the problem is. It's like, how, how can you make that process easier? And how can you make it to where you don't have to, um, where it's not any more challenging than it needs to be. So it, whether that's leaving your shoes at the door, whether that is taking a gym bag with you, whether that is, um, like I said, listening to certain music that keeps you motivated, whether it's looking at inspiring pictures or consuming inspiring content, like there's, there's so many different things that can um, I like that help tool. develop that habit. 100%. Like I think I'm going to take that from you as far as like, you know, lighting the incense and like really creating... I'm kind of like a, a nomad at this point. So mm-hmm. I don't, you know, just being in your incredible home, thanks for having me, by the way. It's like, it's actually inspiring to see that you've created this, this space for yourself. Cause I think there's so much um, creativity here. I mean, it seems like very fertile ground where like, there's so many things to grow from. I mean, you have this podcast studio and, you know, all these things. And for me, like, that's something that I'm looking to manifest in the next, mm-hmm. you know, few months, six months. Cause I need that space mm-hmm. to grow from. You need to declare it right now, bro. Yeah. Boom. I'm yeah. going to get my own place, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go to like Yemen, which I am going to Yemen soon. So To Yemen? Yeah, that's going to be the next trip. What brings you to Yemen? Um, there's these incredible trees there called dragon blood trees. Okay. And um, from a photographic standpoint, and just um, this whole island is called Socotra, and it's this incredible island. I don't want to... I guess I just gave it away, but it's like <laughs> almost untouched. Like very few people have been there. And I yeah. found this incredible, a buddy of mine named Rob told me about it. And um, there's this tour company that gives visas and that allows, they, they basically make it happen for you. Cause wow. Yemen's kind of like a dangerous place to visit. I mean, it's not super safe, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that's going to be the exciting trip that closes out the year. That's beautiful, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of a little jealous. I hate to say, use that word, but uh, a little envious of the places that you've been in the, the experiences that you've got. To, I'm waiting for our next trip together, man. I know, man. Let's we do need to, something. I, well, I feel now that like the world is opening back up. and Let's make it an uh, intention in 2022 to, to yeah. maybe uh, join forces, maybe a fitness yoga retreat. Yeah. Yeah. I've hosted a few of those with, with Andrew before. Yeah, and it yeah, looks I'd like they to, went really well. So I'd love to, you know, combine the East and yeah. the West and all your you know, experience. And I think we could really deliver a, um, a nice, well-rounded hey, I'm retreat. Down. I'm down. And maybe I'll attend one of your teacher trainings too, right? You have one of those coming up too. I do, maybe yeah. that can be the spot where we I would, connect. I would love for, yeah. to have you. I mean, you're already a yoga teacher in my eyes, but um, <laughs> if, if you want me to teach you how to do a few yoga poses, I, can, I can definitely help you with that. I could use the assistance. <laughs> when, is, when is that training? That's going to be in June um, of 2022. So okay. it's, a, it's a 20-day immersive style training. So, you know, most trainings are, some trainings are spread out over six to eight months. But this wow. one's really cool because it's in Costa Rica and you're just in this confined environment and um, you just immerse yourself. So for 21 days, you know, you, 30 to 40 students from around the world get together and we just do daily yoga and meditation. And you really just learn and immerse yourself in this specific mm. style that has deep, deep roots and, and a deep lineage. Yeah, everybody that I've talked to, that sounds amazing and incredible. And I'm going to tentatively put that on my schedule for next year. Uh, but everybody that I've talked to that's gone through a yoga teacher training has said, the same thing. It's life before yoga teacher training and then life after it. <laughs> yeah. Like it, you it's, have it's, a, it's a life training, you know, yeah. I mean, yoga is a, a big part of it, but I think it teaches you so much more mm-hmm. and it's, uh, it just puts you in this, this more receptive open place. And I think everyone can benefit. From it. Mm-hmm. And one thing, um, I really wanted to ask you, given the nature of your story and your upbringing is, what piece of advice would get, would you give your younger self? I would say just to be 
more forgiving of myself, more, more compassionate, you know, less hard on myself, less judgmental. All those things we talked about, you know, it's like just, you know, when you look in the mirror, just give yourself a, you know, it's, you know, it's okay. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest piece of advice is um, that I would just tell myself is like, you know, it's all going to be okay. <laughs> you know, at the end of the movie, I think that if, if you, if you only knew, and I think it, it, it's always this way, no matter what the end result is, it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And um, I think, I think that's the advice I would give to myself in the past and now, you know? You know, spoiler alert, the end of your life, Nimai, everything's going to be okay. (laughs) It sounds so funny, but if you like, you know, it kind of takes a lot of the pressure off and it takes a lot of the the angst off when you can really just know when the, when the credits are rolling at the end of your movie, you know, it's going to be okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think we all, every challenge that I've, I've been given on my path has been an opportunity for me to grow and get stronger. So. Um, I'm willing to face whatever I have to face and um, to to come out successful. So, but ultimately, be more forgiving of myself. That's probably the the biggest advice. That's a great piece of advice. Be kind, be gentle, be compassionate with yourself. Um, That's um yeah, I, you said it right there. Be kind is the the word I was looking for. You know, be be kind. I, I guess the advice, if I were to make it a full sentence, would be, you know, be as kind to yourself as you would to you know, a friend, because it's so much easier to be nice to somebody else. You know, I, I have so much easier of a time giving a massage than getting one. And, um, I think a lot of people struggle with that. I, I'm, I'm sure. Do you, do you, do you have that too? Like, do, no, I have no problem getting massages. <laughs> <laughs> no problem whatsoever. You know, it's like, uh, I, I like just be, be kinder to yourself, you know, just like you were to take a friend out for a meal, you know, take, take yourself out for a meal. You know, take yourself to a movie, take, you know, spoil yourself every now and then. And um, that was one of the, read this article on five regrets of the dying. There was this hospice nurse that was a nurse for over 35 years or something like that. And she, over the years, she would journal and she found five common regrets. And one of them was just to be, to be kinder to themselves. Mm -hmm. They wish they would have worked less. They wish they would have, you know, kept in touch with, with friends more and not let relationships slip by over the years because life's you know moved by quick mm-hmm. and uh, i feel like this is getting kind of sad but no no it's all, <laughs> but, it's you know, all very accurate, sometimes man. it's you know you gotta just you gotta think about these things because you know life and life goes by really quick and it's i mean i'm already 25 if i live to 100 that's a you know that's a quarter of of my life you know and it only gets it only goes faster as you get older at least that's what i hear from my elders <laughs> that's true i'm 32 right now I still feel 23, but yeah, it feels weird to say 32. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. My grandma, she's like, I think she's like just turned like 80 and she tells me she still feels like a little girl. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when she looks in the mirror, she sees the wrinkles and everything, but like inside she still feels like a little girl. So it's age is this very interesting, like thing that happens. It's part of it. It's part of this whole journey. It's part of this whole process and learning to accept ourselves and love ourselves every step of the way. So just enjoy life. Yeah, Jonah, thank you so much, bro. Nimai, thank wow. I mean, so much thanks for coming for, on the show. Thanks for pulling all that out of me and, uh, and getting incredibly honored to have to to be on this podcast. And um, I can't wait to to follow it and see the other incredible conversations you have. And um, I look forward to, to mm-hmm. skateboarding tomorrow morning. Yeah, let's do it, <laughs> man. And thanks again for sharing your insight, sharing your experiences. Um, I know that anybody that's listening will get a ton out of this episode and just for being a light, for being a beacon, for helping others, um, find their own light too. I really appreciate you and everything you're doing in this world. So thank you. I'm going to stay. And if you're looking to follow Jonah, I'm going to tag his social, his, uh, his website, everything you want to definitely give him a follow. He has some of the most best photography that I've ever seen. Travel photography, landscape photography. He's been to some of the most incredible places. So it's definitely worth, uh, worth a follow. And he shares some really great insights as well, as you can tell. So if you enjoyed this episode, please, please, please share it with somebody who you feel would benefit from this conversation. Also, please feel free to leave any kind of review or comment on the iTunes podcast or Spotify or YouTube, wherever you're listening or watching this podcast it really does help gain exposure for the show and that way we can attract even more incredible guests that want to come on and share their stories so thank you all so much for listening sending you all love and light Mm.